Munich, 1945. Chapter 30. As soon as they could, the Americans took us away from Dachau. We had walked and been trucked and been taken by train so many times to so many new horrible places that some of the prisoners were reluctant to go. But the Americans assured us that all was over and gave us blankets and food for the short truck ride into Munich. The Allies occupied the city and there they would house us until they figured out what to do with us. I was put in a building that had once, I was told, been a barracks for SS officers. An American soldier led me upstairs to a big room filled with bunk beds and told me which one was mine. How many other people do I have to share it with? I asked him. He looked surprised. Nobody, he said. It's yours. A bed all to myself. Then, wonder upon wonders. The soldier gave me a blanket, a pillow, and sheets for the bed. Sheets. My fellow prisoners and I looked around at one another like we were on some alien planet. I hadn't slept on a sheet, nor had a pillow or a blanket for five years, perhaps six. With shaking hands, I began to make the bed. I didn't even know how, didn't remember the feeling of linens and soft things. The soldier helped me, and I climbed carefully into my new bed. A real mattress with springs. My body sunk into it, and my head fell into the pillow. What luxury! Beside my bed, there was a little table, and on the table, the Americans had given me more gifts. A washcloth, a cup, and a toothbrush. I picked up the toothbrush reverently and cried as I held it in my hands. I remembered that day, standing at the pump in the camp. Which camp had it been? When I wondered when I had ever been so fortunate as to have something so simple as a toothbrush. Piece by piece, bit by bit, the Americans were giving me my life back. That night in the dining hall, we sat in chairs. At a table. I hadn't seen a chair in six years, nor a table. The tables were long, with places set for ten people at each. The American soldiers stationed with us came in and sat down with us. We were to eat the same food the soldiers ate. There were plates at the table and silverware. I picked up a fork and looked at it the way I had my toothbrush, like it was some artifact from another world. There were napkins, too. I watched the Americans tuck their napkins into their collars and did the same. And then they brought the food. Big platters of roast beef, mashed potatoes, gravy, and baskets of rolls. More bread than any of us had seen in years. The man across from me started to cry, and the American soldiers didn't know what to do. Would you pass the salt? I asked him. The man looked up at me through his tears, and he started to laugh. He was laughing and crying at the same time. Pass the salt, he said. Yes, he said, laughing. Yes, let me pass you the salt. And so we began to pass the food around, this feast the Americans had laid out for us. They couldn't understand our tears, couldn't know how amazing such a simple meal was to us. Would they ever understand? Would anyone who hadn't survived what we had survived understand? We could tell them all about it, describe in every detail the horrors of the camps and the way we were treated. But no one who had not been there would ever truly understand. As the food filled my plate and the soldiers and former prisoners around me began to eat, I remembered that day in Krakow so long ago, the day the war had begun. I remembered the food on the table in my old apartment in Porgorzy and all my family sitting around me. Mother and father, Uncle Mashi and Aunt Gisela, and my little cousin, Zika, Uncle Abraham and Aunt Fila, my cousin, Sala, David, and their two boys. They were all dead and gone now. I thought, too, of my friend Fred and the boy who had been hanged for trying to escape, and the man who had fought back, and all the other people I had watched die. They filled my table and the tables all around me, taking the places of all the real people in the room. The dead would always be with me, I knew, even when I was surrounded by life again, even if the Americans gave me back all the objects I had lost. It would be the same for all the other prisoners, too, I knew. They smiled as they ate, but there was sadness in their eyes, 
sadness for the people we had lost and would never get back. But I was wrong about losing everyone. A few days later, I was out for a walk in my Munich neighborhood. I walked the streets whenever I could. I still wasn't used to the fact that I could walk as I pleased, that I wasn't gripped by thirst and hunger every second. I was thinking about what the rest of my life would hold when I saw a familiar face. She passed by on the other side of the street, and for a moment, I thought I had to be mistaken. Mrs. Immerglick, I called. I dashed across the street to get a closer look. Mrs. Immerglick? The woman turned. It was, it was Mrs. Immerglick, the mean old lady who'd lived across the hall from me in Krakow. She burst into tears when I told her who I was, and she hugged me so hard I couldn't breathe. Oh, Yannick, Yannick, it's so good to see you, she said at last. The last time I saw you, you were just a boy. Now look at you. You're a grown man. I had grown, even in the camps. When I looked in the mirror these days, I didn't recognize the person staring back at me. The last time I saw you, I told her, you yelled at me for bouncing a ball in the hall. Yes, yes, you and that ball. She gripped my shoulders tight, as though if she let go, I would disappear. Oh, my dear boy, how I wish we could go back there now. How I wish we could start again. I wouldn't have yelled at you, I promise. I laughed, a sound as strange to me as my own face. I hadn't laughed enough in the last six years to recognize the sound of it. It's all right, Mrs. Immerglick. What about your boys, the rest of your family? Fred, she said. Her son's name was Fred, like my friend who had died. She had tears in her eyes. Fred survived, like you. My Fred made it, but no one else. I nodded, reaching out to squeeze her arm. Is Fred here in Munich? I asked. I'd love to see him. Yes, yes, and you know about your cousin, Yuzek, of course. My heart gave a small leap. No. I was almost afraid to hope. Oh, my dear boy, your cousin Yuzek and his wife are alive, and they're here in Munich. Yuzek, I hadn't seen him in years. Mrs. Immerglick brought me back to her apartment to write their address down for me on a piece of paper. I walked back out, holding the paper in both hands and staring at it. I had family, a cousin still. Family, I wasn't alone. I went to see them as soon as I could. Cousin Yuzek met me at the door, hugging me even harder than Mrs. Immerglick had. He pulled me inside and introduced me again to his wife, Hela. We cried and laughed and cried some more. How did you survive? How did you make it? We asked each other again and again, telling our stories long into the night. Yuzek and his wife had survived by hiding with friends, and they had taken in another family, the Gamzers, who had survived the same way. There were three of them, Isaac, Barbara, and little Luncia, a 12-year-old girl who sat in the corner reading a book the whole time. What are your plans now, Yannick? What will you do? Isaac Gamzer asked me as we sat around their table. I shrugged. It was true. Life had to go on. I like movies. There's a theater near where I live now. I thought I would try to get a job as a projectionist. No, no, Yannick. You need to go to America, Yuzak told me. That's where the opportunities are. That's where you can build a new life for yourself. America? It felt so out of my reach now. I don't have any papers, any money, I replied. How would I ever get to America? There's a special program, he told me, for Jewish orphans of the war. They will help you get your visa and pay your way. I was instantly excited by the idea of going to America. I remembered the movies I'd watched as a boy in Krakow. Did everyone ride around on horses and wear cowboy hats? Did gangsters have shootouts in the streets? Could I really find a home there? I had to find out. I registered for the program. I talked to lawyers. I filled out forms. I changed my name to Jacob Grenner and took to calling myself Jack, like the American soldiers called me. The process took months, years. All the while, I came back to visit Yuzik and Hela almost every day, and soon I became good friends with the Gamzers too. 
Little Luncia and I still didn't have much to say to each other, but Isaac and Barbara became like second parents to me, even more so than Yuzik and Hela. They became family. It was hard to leave my new family when the papers finally came through in March of 1948, but I had spent years trying to get to America, and I was determined to go. Yuzek, Hela, the Gamzers, and I had an emotional farewell before I boarded the train that would take me to the coast, where I would catch a ship to the United States. The Gamzers planned to come to America too when they could, and I promised to stay in touch. It had been almost a decade since the Nazis had rolled into Krakow, and almost that long since I'd last seen my mother and father, my uncles and aunts and other cousins, but they were gone now. I would always yearn for them and remember them, but there was nothing left for me in Europe but ghosts. I had said goodbye to all of them long, long ago. I stepped on board the train and didn't look back. For nine years, I had done everything I could to survive. Now, it was time to live. Afterward. While the story of Jack Grenner is true and remarkable, this book is a work of fiction. Historical fiction. As an author, I've taken some liberties with time and events to paint a fuller and more representative picture of the Holocaust as a whole. All this was done with Jack's blessing so that the horrors and realities of the Holocaust beyond those that he personally experienced would not be forgotten. Jack did, in fact, survive the harsh conditions of the Krakow ghetto by living in a pigeon coop with his parents. He baked bread under cover of night with his aunt and uncle, had his bar mitzvah in a basement, and watched his parents deported by the Nazis, never to see them alive again. At Plazow, Jack hid under floorboards <clears throat> from Amengoth and was inexplicably spared by the madman when he emerged. Even more incredibly, while Jack was at Plazow, he worked for a time at the very same enamelware factory where German businessman Oskar Schindler later saved hundreds of Jews from extermination. Schindler was able to protect the Jews who worked there because Goth made enough money off the factory to look the other way. But Jack was transferred away from Plazow a mere three months before Schindler began protecting his workers from the Nazis. Jack only learned how close he was to salvation years later when the true story of Schindler's List was told. Jack then went on to survive nine more concentration camps. At Walishka, he toiled beside the famous salt statues that became a tourist attraction after the war. At Birkenau, he waited under the gas heads for death, only to be showered with cold water instead. At Auschwitz, Jack came face to face with the infamous Nazi monster, Joseph Mengel, and lived. Jack endured slavery and starvation, death marches and cattle cars, allied bombings and Nazi beatings. Of the more than one and a half million Jewish children living in Europe before the war, Jack was one of only half a half million to survive. After the war, Jack immigrated to America and became an American citizen. Less than a year after he became a citizen, he was drafted into the U.S. Army and sent to Korea to fight in the Korean War. There, he survived again, this time with a gun in his hands and a pack on his back, all the while keeping up his promised correspondence with the Gamzer family, who had at last immigrated to America. When Jack's two years in the Army were up, he came to visit the Gamzers in New York City. He discovered that little Luncia, the girl he had met in Munich, who always sat in the corner reading a book, had grown up into a beautiful young woman. Jack fell in love with Luncia, who had since changed her name to Ruth, and in a few months they were married. Jack and Ruth now live in Brooklyn, New York. They have two grown sons and four grandchildren. Together, Jack and Ruth travel the country to speak about their experiences in the Holocaust. I had the pleasure of meeting Jack and Ruth while working on this book, and it is my honor to write about Jack's life so the generations that follow will never forget. Jack still bears the tattoo with the number the Nazis gave him, B3087, but it is his name 
Jack Grenner that lives on. The end. Hope you liked it.